Hola. Hola. Buenos días, gracias por, por venir al Unity Developer Day México 2017. Perdón por, la, por eh, el retraso, pero ya vamos a, a continuar. Bienvenidos a todos y a todas las, las personas que están aquí. Um, eh, mi nombre es Arturo Núñez, eh, trabajo en, en, en Unity para México, América Latina y demás. Algunos ya los, los conozco, otros no, pero voy a estar todo el día por si, si quieren platicar y todo. Me va, daría mucho gusto eh, pues poder platicar con, con la mayoría de ustedes. Eh, rápidamente platicar sobre, sobre qué hacemos nosotros en, en Unity, y por qué hacemos estos eventos y cuál es el objetivo. Pues estos son, son, son nuestros pilares, ¿no? eh, seguramente los habrán visto en algún otro lado, que es eh, pues siempre democratizar el desarrollo, que todos podamos hacer aplicaciones, juegos, realidad virtual, no importa cuál sea nuestro, nuestro background, ¿no? si somos programadores, artistas, lo que sea, podamos hacer juegos. Resolver problemas difíciles, eso también es, es importante en especial para nuestra industria, eh, creemos que no vale la pena ponernos a reinventar la rueda y tal vez tratar de hacer nuestras propias herramientas y en 30 años ya empezar a hacer juegos. Lo mejor es hacer juegos ahorita y usar una herramienta que, que ya está ahí ¿no? y que está en constante evolución. Y la otra es facilitar el éxito. Eh, facilitar el éxito, pues eh, principalmente es lograr nuestros sueños de hacer juegos, de hacer aplicaciones, pero también es bien importante para nosotros que, que los estudios o los, las personas que están haciendo sus proyectos eh, puedan vivir de estos proyectos, eso es lo, lo que buscamos. Y el Developer Day es, es una de estas cosas que reúne todo, todos nuestros, nuestros pilares. El año pasado tuvimos el Developer Day, ¿alguien vino eh, o bueno, fue al Developer Day el año pasado? Puede levantar su mano. Ok, poquitos. Entonces no estuvo tan bueno y nadie regresó y so solo son, son nuevas personas. Bueno, el, 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 el objetivo de tener un evento así es poder traer más gente de Unity. Yo pues constantemente interactúo con ustedes, pero hay, hay, hay otras 11 personas de Unity, ingenieros, eh, gente de negocios y todo, que vale mucho la pena que puedan, que puedan interactuar con ellos, aprender a hacer ese tra esa transferencia de conocimiento. Quién sabe en algún momento que, los, que puedan utilizar esos contactos pues para, para lograr sus, sus, sus metas. Eh, este, este año es un mapa de la gente que, que, que se inscribió, muchos me dijeron, oye, se me olvidó inscribirme y se están inscribiendo, entonces no van a aparecer sus ciudades aquí probablemente. Lo que me sorprende mucho es saber que hay gente de toda la república, gente de, de todos lados de la ciudad, eh, de, del país viniendo aquí, de hecho tenemos gente de Colombia, gente de Costa Rica, eh, gente de, 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 de Estados Unidos también, nos, nos da mucho gusto, habiendo tantos eventos allá que, que consideren venir Aquí, y, y también otra cosa bien importante es que el, el evento el año pasado esperábamos como 150 personas, llegaron como 200 personas, este año queríamos que hubiera pues 250 y hay como 320 personas registradas. Entonces nos da mucho gusto ver este crecimiento, eh, nos da mucho gusto ver que haya, que haya este interés y pues queremos seguir haciendo cada año. Eh, nada más para platicar un poquito de, de, de cosas ya técnicas que estamos haciendo en Unity, eh, nos estamos enfocando mucho en hacer más herramientas que sean más accesibles para los que son artistas o diseñadores. ¿no? A veces cuando, cuando no somos ingenieros y de, queremos hacer una aplicación de realidad virtual, una aplicación de realidad aumentada, pues tal vez bajar Unity y decir, oye, pues aquí de dónde hago algo, tengo que aprender a programar y después usar Unity. Bueno, ahora lo que estamos haciendo es metiendo muchas herramientas para que los artistas puedan entrar, utilizar Unity y sin necesidad de programar, hacer cosas eh, muy complejas. ¿no? En este caso, es, es, eh, una de las herramientas es Anima 2D. Adquirimos una empresa que, que desarrolla una herramienta para hacer animaciones basadas en, en, en esqueletos. Entonces, eso va a estar integrado dentro de Unity para que si alguien está haciendo animaciones, caricaturas en 2D, lo pueda hacer, obviamente, haciéndolo interactivo. Otras herramientas que hemos, que hemos metido es, es mucho con la parte visual. Queremos que, que, que los artistas, los que saben de iluminación, los que saben de esta parte, le pierdan el miedo a Unity y ellos sean los que hagan la iluminación, que ellos hagan el setup de iluminación. ¿no? Porque si yo como programador hago mi escena de Unity y pongo mil luces y todo se ve totalmente blanco, pues no, ese no es el chiste. Por eso queremos abrir más para, para, para artistas y diseñadores. Este ejemplo es algo que se llama el Progressive Light Mapper. Eh, si alguien ha intentado hacer el Bake 
o, o cocinado de sus luces y de sus sombras, puede tardar horas en, en hacerse, ¿no? Algunos casos hasta días, pero ya si va un día y no termina, yo creo que algo, algo malo pasó. Pero bueno, la, la idea de esto es, es que puedan eh, tener un, un feedback más rápido de ver cómo se está comportando la iluminación. ¿no? Esto está en experimental, pero así como esta herramienta, vienen muchas, de hecho hay una plática después del keynote con Mark Shonagall, que está por ahí, eh, sobre una herramienta que se llama Timeline, nos permite hacer secuencias animadas, secuencias interactivas, sin necesidad de meter código. Entonces, eso es lo que, lo que estamos trabajando mucho. Entonces, ahora les voy a presentar a, a, a una compañera, ella viene de Brasil, ella está encargada de la parte educativa de Unity, entonces sé que hay muchos profesores o gente que, que viene eh, representando una universidad, una, una escuela, eh, conózcanla y ella va a estar aquí el resto del día, si quieren ver temas relacionados con educación, eh, es con, con Aline Tosini, un aplauso para ella. Oh, shit, yeah. Hola, ¿cómo están? Yo sé que tengo tres minutitos para hablar con ustedes sobre las soluciones educativas que tenemos en Unity. Primero, tengo que hablar que estoy... Soy brasileña y pueden observar que hablo portugal <risa> y no <risa> español <risa> entonces ya estoy pidiendo disculpa porque yo respeto mucho su idioma es muy bonito me parece como como una canción español más bonito que el portugués para mí <risa> y la cultura también entonces estoy acá hoy para hablar con ustedes uh, sobre las herramientas que tenemos los objetivos de estas herramientas educativas es traer actualización, traer una manera de aprender más sobre Unity. ¿Está bien? ¿Y cómo pueden utilizar? Entonces, las herramientas de educativas sirven para empoderar la comunidad de Budojego la comunidad de profesionales que trabajan con la producción de videojuegos. Pero antes de empezar, antes de iniciar, me gustaría de pedir disculpa por algunos cambios con la certificación. Nosotros hemos cancelado algunas sesiones de certificación en algunos países y la razón es debido a un bug en la plataforma de la certificación. Entonces, yo agradezco la comprensión de todos y quiero informar que estamos cambiando la plataforma para una herramienta mejor, más efectiva. Entonces, en breve, tenemos nuevas fechas para ofrecer la certificación para ustedes. Hablando rápidamente, sobre las herramientas de aprendizaje y de empoderamiento. La primera herramienta es la certificación. ¿Por qué hacer la certificación? ¿Por qué presentar el examen? Para validar su conocimiento en el mercado. Hoy ya tenemos empresas contratando profesionales que son certificados. Otra herramienta es nuestro curso en línea. Entonces, tal vez puede mm, entender que no está preparado para la certificación. Entonces, hay una herramienta en línea que ofrece un curso preparatorio para la certificación. Pero Aline puede me preguntar cómo yo sé si yo estoy preparado para el examen o no. En Unity website, en el website de Unity, ustedes pueden encontrar las competencias y conocimientos que son requeridos en el examen. 
Entonces, acá pueden ver este archivo, acá, este documento, muestra los objetivos de aprendizaje y los conocimientos del examen. Puede verificar acá y después comprender si está preparado o no. Si piensas que no está preparado, poder acceder al website de Unity y comprar el curso preparatorio online. Otra manera de actualización y aprendizaje son los talleres que Arturo y otros profesionales ofrecen en la América Latina. Ustedes pueden verificar en Unity, en el website de Unity también, en la parte de eventos, las fechas para estos talleres, que es también una manera de aprendizaje y actualización. Otra cosa, para instructores, profesores, instituciones y escuelas que están acá, hay dos materiales gratis de contenidos con instrucciones de clase. Ustedes pueden acceder a este link o hablar conmigo después y acceder a, la, a, la, a los documentos con esas informaciones muy interesantes para uso en clase. Otra cosa importante, las licencias de Unity desde noviembre de 2016 son gratis para escuelas, ya era gratis para escuelas y ahora universidad también. Entonces, sus clases, laboratorios pueden tener licencias sin costo ahora. Si necesitan solicitar, si quieren solicitar las licencias, pueden acceder a este link y hacer su pedido. Para finalizar, muy rápidamente, uh, nosotros estamos trabajando con centros de entrenamiento autorizados Unity. ¿Qué es esto? Tornarse un aliado Unity para poder ofrecer certificaciones para el mercado, ofrecer cursos Unity para el mercado. Es un negocio. Entonces, para escuelas, universidades, centros de entrenamiento que están acá, y que tienen interés en tornarse un centro de entrenamiento autorizado Unity, pueden hablar conmigo sobre esto. Estaré hoy por todo el tiempo acá, hasta el final del evento, y podemos hablar. O también pueden escribir en mi correo. Entonces, mi, yo quiero, mi mensaje es que el equipo de educación de Unity quiere ofrecer para ustedes herramientas de empoderamiento para que ustedes poda, puedan trabajar más, producir más videojuegos y, y se quedar cada vez mejor, mejor, mejor en sus carreras. ¿Está bien? Gracias por su atención. Ah, perdón. Es que hay que cambiar la entrada. Eh, el siguiente speaker es el, el invitado, el invitado especial. No le voy a quitar tiempo, solo lo voy a presentar rápidamente. Como el año pasado que tuvi, tuvimos a Hamilton de, 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 de Brasil, eh, este año quisimos traer a un, un speaker que creemos que además del conocimiento técnico que tiene, tiene mucho conocimiento sobre la parte del negocio de hacer juegos o aplicaciones interactivas. Entonces, es, es, es importante, él va a estar todo el tiempo aquí por si quieren platicar con él. Y les doy la bienvenida a Dave Bedery de Sprite Fox. Eh, un aplauso. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, Can I break this up over here? Yeah, yeah. good. Okay. Good? Good. Okay. Um, first, I, I want to apologize. I, I really wanted to try to give this lecture in Spanish, and I, I practiced, I tried. It, um, it took me 30 minutes to get through the first three or four slides, and I was like, okay, I'm not going to do this to them. <laughs> so, so forgive me for that. Um, so yeah, I'm the, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Spry Fox. Um, 
I'll just tell you a little bit about us very briefly. We're, we've been uh, around for over seven years now. Uh, we started with just two people. It was just myself and my co-founder, Daniel Cook, um, who writes the Lost Garden blog. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Um, now we're 17 people working full-time on our games. Uh, that doesn't include, uh, we have some part-time folks who help with like audio and localization and things like that, of course, but 17 full-time. Um, we're bootstrapped, so we, we don't have, no one's ever, we've never taken money from investors, we've never taken any loans. Um, the way we made that work is in the first two years of the business, we would work 20 or 30 hours a week consulting or work for hire or whatever, anything we could do to bring in money. And then as much time as we could before being exhausted, we would work on our own games. And that's how we basically funded the company and got it to the point where we could um, start you know, hiring people and doing all that stuff. Um, over the last seven years, we've built dozens of prototypes, most of which you've never seen because they were not good and we threw them away. And, uh, and we've launched 13 games, and that's, um, that's not including like ports. Like if it's just a simple port to, you know, from one device to another, I didn't include it in the 13. That's 13 original games uh, in seven years. Um, and what a lot of people don't know is that we're totally virtual. Uh, we, we employ people all over the world, and they work from home. So we have people in the United States, we have pe someone in Argentina, we have two people in Brazil, we have one person in the UK, one person in Germany, etc. Um, uh, we're best known for three games. This is Triple Town. This was our first successful game, for those of you who know it. It's a match three game. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is Realm of the Mad God, which we co-developed with two other guys. It's a bullet hell shooter MMO. Uh, we, we don't continue to operate it. We sold it to Kabam many years ago, but it was quite successful. And then Alpha Bear was our most recent successful game. I'm glad to hear that some of you are familiar with it. It's a word puzzle game uh, that uh, in 2016, Google gave it their Indie Game of the Year award, uh, which we were very proud of. Uh, and it did quite well in 2015 and 2016. But like I said, we did 10 other games too. Um, so let me tell you, oops, wow, that got loud. Um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about us and, and how I think that it matters to, to you guys. So we're, let me explore what it means to say we're a virtual family. Uh, so this is, what we, this is what we looked like a little more, like a year and a half ago, uh, back when we were still just 11 people. Um, that was the first time we ever met face to face. Um, we, yeah, we had been working together for years and many of us had never seen each other. Uh, the, one of the guys in the center, the one who's sticking out his hands like this, that's Christian, the lead developer of Triple Town. He's one of my closest friends in the world. We had been working together for five years and we had never met each other uh, until, in, until this thing. Um, so what does it mean to be a virtual family? Uh, it's, a, it's a couple things. One I've already discussed, we're virtual. We don't work together, we, we, we work from home. Uh, but the other thing is that we really try to be like a family. So uh, what does that mean? It means things like, um, like uh, uh, we want to, uh, we try not to ever do layoffs. Like I would rather take a huge pay cut than lay off anyone from the company. And I think anyone, everyone else in the company feels that way. We try to hire people who we trust, people who are highly responsible. You know, in other words, it's like, like someone you would want in your family, right? Um, that's how we try to, to structure the company. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I think that's so important in a moment. Uh, but I think it's something that everyone should, when you're making a company, it's the kind of thing that's worth considering doing. Um, time zone issues have been a little bit of a struggle for us. Um, working with someone who's in Germany when you're in Seattle is not necessarily the easiest thing. So what we do to compensate for that is that if you're not in our time zone, uh, if you're in one, like in Europe or in Africa or Asia or whatever, then what we ask people to do is try to find at least two or three hours during your day where you can overlap with the people who are in the West Coast. Um, and it, that doesn't mean that they have to work three hours extra. They just work three hours less in the norm, quote unquote normal part of the day, right? So uh, Andrew, our engineer in the UK, for example, he'll work two or three hours at night so he can overlap with us. And that kind of helps and helps us keeping, keep it feel more like a family and enable us to communicate with each other. Um, um, but the, the most important thing is basically that we expect people, we, 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 again, I want to trust people, I want to be able to rely on people, we expect people to be very independent and self-managing. We don't micromanage, like if you need someone to be telling you what to do, you'll do very poorly in Spry Fox. We don't tell each other what to do. Um, and so why did I make it this uh, like a company when I co-founded co this with Daniel? Um, well, part of it's just my personality. I wanted that. I wanted to work in a place where people loved and respected each other. But it's not just that. When I was a business student, I got my MBA at MIT back in, uh, from 2003 to 2005. And when I was at MIT studying, one of the research, some of the research that I was exposed to was this research. Uh, it's oh, it's cutting it off. It's not showing. 
on this slide. Over there, you can see it. Um, it's, a Stanford, it's the Stanford Project on Emerging Companies, and it was research done from, uh, I think it was like 2000, it was like a, over an eight-year period in the early 2000s, uh, and what they did is they tracked 200 startups that were high-tech startups and broke them into five cultural categories. So there were the autocratic companies, and you can kind of guess, those are the companies where the boss is like the dictator, like, you will do what I say, and that's it. Um, there were the engineering companies, and those are kind of, that's like Google and Facebook, right? Companies where engineers are the drivers of the company. They drive the culture, they drive all the decisions. Um, there were the, the bureaucratic companies. Those are companies with lots of rules and regulations, and it's very, it takes a long time to do anything. Uh, there were the star companies. And star companies are companies that, um, where they hire, like, they try to hire the very best people, and then everyone else in the company, their job is to help those people do what they do best. Uh, so oftentimes, like, uh, drug manufacturing companies will be like this, where they'll hire a famous researcher, and that person runs the lab, and everyone else in the lab, they're just there to make sure that that person, that woman or that man, can do their research and make the next great cancer medicine or whatever. Um, and then the last category is the one that we're in. It's the commitment culture, or what I call the family culture. And those are companies that try to be like families, where it's like we're committed to our employees, our employees are committed to us. And what you can see on this slide is that when they were tracking the, uh, the likelihood that a company would fail over this period of eight years, what they found was that uh, the commitment or family-style companies were dramatically less likely to fail. They were much more resilient to problems. And I, I never forgot this when I learned this research in, in, in business school. I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then further, they, the, just another thing that they showed, that this is the likelihood that a company will have an initial public offering, which is not necessarily the only measure of success, right? But it's a very concrete measure of success. Um, and your chance, you can see here, the chances of a family-style company having an IPO were dramatically higher, dramatically higher than any other one. Um, and I, I thought this was very interesting. And so anyway, I always wanted kind of to, to make a kind of company that would be like a family, and this gave me the, the courage to do it. I was like, aha, uh -huh, okay, so it's not, because uh, a lot of people you'll tell them, it's like, oh, I want to make a business like a family, and they'll say, oh, you're an idealist. It will never work. That's not, business and family don't mix. Well, you know what? According to this research, it does. So, mwah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, so let me talk a little bit more about how we communicate, because we are virtual. We live and die by Slack. This is our, this is our Slack. Uh, you're looking at the Spry Fox channel. Uh, it was recently one of our employees, Sarah's birthday, and so everyone's like, happy birthday. You know, we, we, you know, we, we, we have fun. And this is where, whatever, 95% of the communication takes place. We do, however, and I think this is critically important, we do also have a lot of communication in voice. Uh, through you know, Skype or Hangouts or whatever, or through the Slack thing now that they added it. Um, it's, not, it's not a ton, but any given person in the company will, at least probably two or three times a week, they'll have to do a voice or, or a video call. And the reason is because, and this is something for all of you to remember, particularly if you have remote companies, um, a lot of research has shown that it's easy to have misunderstandings in text. It's very, very easy. People, in particular, have a hard time judging your tone in text. And so it can be very easy to be offended by something that someone is saying, even when it wasn't intended in an offensive manner. And, uh, and we have found that. We have definitely had times in the past in Spry Fox where there has been intense tension, uh, you know, the, the bad side of being a family, right? <laughs> Some family drama. Um, and, uh, and we have found that the only way to keep that in check is to make sure that people are doing, ideally, face-to-face -face chat, because even voice is not necessarily always enough. I and mean, sometimes you have to see someone's facial expressions to understand what it is that they're trying to tell you. Um, so we try to do that, but we limit it. You know, like I said, most people in the company will have three, two or three voice calls in a week. I'm the CEO, I'm on every project, so of course I'm having more, but um, that's what it looks like. Um, and the other thing is that for a long time, it's interesting, for a lot of people worry that if you use Slack, it will go out of control and you, there'll be too much non-work chatter and it will be distraction. We, we had the opposite problem for whatever it's worth. For a long time, it was all business all the time and we felt kind of bad about it and so we kept having to encourage each other like, hey, like, we can talk about other things and let's create a now listening channel where we can talk about what music we're listening to and let's talk Hearthstone channel and we can talk about what decks we're building and whatever. And it really, we had to encourage each other to do it. Um, so I, I don't think, I think people who worry about uh, the fact that Slack will devolve into a, a, a disaster, I think that's not necessarily the case, obviously. Um, what else about us? So we're pioneers, and this is both good and bad. 
Um, and I think it's, I have some lessons to share with you guys on this front. So uh, what's an example of us being pioneers? Um, this, most people don't know, this is the first version of Triple Town. It's a black, it was a black and white game for the e-ink Kindle devices, for the early e-ink Kindle devices, back when Amazon was trying to make that into a games platform, which, as we all now know, was not successful. <laughs> but, but we were the first, this was the, this was the very first indie game to ever launch on the platform. The first game was uh, some free game that they developed internally, the next one was Scrabble from EA, and the next one was this one. And, uh, and the game ended up getting really good reviews, and you know, the platform wasn't very successful, but because there was no competition, it actually sold okay, so we made some money. And more importantly, we learned that this was a good mechanic, that people really liked this mechanic. So we ended up developing it further, and we made the Facebook version and the mobile version, and those ended up being, of course, very successful, something like 12 million players or something of all the different versions of Triple Town. Um, so we were very happy with that. Um, and uh, this has been a, this sort of strategy of trying to be one of the first people on an in interesting new platform, uh, making original new games with n interesting core mechanics. This is core to who we are, and it's one of the reasons I think why we've been able to be successful. Um, but it doesn't always work. And let me give you an example of that. So this game, which most of you won't be familiar with it because it was a failure, uh, this is called Leap Day. Um, this is. I mean, we've made a lot of games, and it's hard to pick your favorites, but this might be my favorite game we've ever made. Um, it was also a disaster. We lost every penny we spent on this, and we spent a lot of money on this, hundreds of thousands developing this. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to explain, which is one of the reasons it failed, but basically, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a cooperative, it's a puzzle game, it's a co-op um, uh, uh, simulation where you and a bunch of other players will create these networks of roads and train tracks, and you have these little workers called Flan. Um, they look like Flan, and, uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, and they have to carry things around and manufacture things and make re recipes, and then they carry them to the central place, and you try to beat this objective. And it's, it's incredibly fun, and uh, unfortunately also incredibly difficult. But let's talk a little bit about why this game failed and why I think this matters uh, for you guys. Um, this game had very original core gameplay. There was no game like it, as far as I know. It had very, a very original metagame. The metagame you know, was it, you know, by necessity to some extent. Um, it had a very original business model. We should have just sold it for 10 or 20 bucks or whatever, but instead we decided we were gonna make it a free-to-play game on the PC several years ago when that was less common. And we didn't even copy someone else's business model because we're insane. We decided to make up our own brand new business model for that, you know what I mean? Um, so it had that. It had a very original art style. There aren't many games that look like this, which is oftentimes a plus, but it made it harder for people to understand understand everything else that was going on. Um, and, uh, and it was multiplayer only, which is in and of itself kind of an experiment. Um, you know, it tend, you know, there, are, there are lots of case studies of games multiplayer only being, it's, I mean, if you're, look, if you're Blizzard, if you're Valve, it's very easy to launch a multiplayer only game. You have an enormous audience and getting concurrency is not difficult for you. But if you're a small indie without a huge fan base necessarily yet, um, you know, relying on a multiplayer only game can be very difficult. Like, I, for example, like the tutorial for this game, like, Imagine a, a tutorial for a super complicated game that you don't understand, and you're experiencing it with other people, some of whom are dropping out, some of whom are flaky, some of whom are griefing you. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not the best. So even the tutorial was a huge experiment. Everything about this game was a huge experiment. And no matter how fun it was, and again, I believe this is, I, I really think this is the best game we've ever made. It didn't matter. There were too many problems to solve. We were not capable of solving them all in a reasonable amount of time. And after, you know, whatever it was, roughly two years of working on this, we had to just say, okay, we're done. And we lost a lot of money on it, and it's all due to the fact that we didn't control ourselves. We tried too hard to do too many experiments. Um, and it doesn't matter how good you are. You can be the best game designer in the world. You're not gonna be able to pull it off. And this is true in lots of industries. So case in point, just so you, it's, you understand that it's not just about games, this is a picture of the model, the, t the Tesla Model X. Tesla is, of course, a very successful company. Uh, uh, the, uh, Elon Musk is one of the most gifted innovators and entrepreneurs of all time. Uh, and here he is talking to Bloomberg about the fact that the Model X was a financial failure. Why? Because they did too many experiments. They tried to do too many new things in the game. Customers didn't understand, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the car. Too, cu customers didn't understand it. It was difficult to market. Uh, here he is, again, admitting on Twitter, calling himself an idiot because he tried too many things. So this is not just games. This applies to almost everything in life. Anytime you try to pack too many experiments into one thing, 
you're just exponentially increasing your odds of failure, which doesn't mean obviously don't experiment. I would hate for that to be the takeaway. Like I think being a pioneer and trying to make original games is one of the most noble things you can do as a game developer, but you have to pick your battles. You do one or two big experiments in a game, right? And that's the way to maximize your chances of success and still do something original. If you try to do five big experiments in a game, you're not guaranteed to fail, but you've made your odds pretty high. Um, so how and why have we survived the seven years? Um, I was a little nervous trying to answer this question when I was writing this lecture for you guys because um, there's this thing called survival bias that you may be familiar with. It's a very common phenomenon. It's uh, people who are survivors don't tend to understand why they survive. They don't understand the, the lucky factors that, uh, you know, it's like, hey, this thing, oh, I think this thing makes me successful, but I don't actually realize that I just happened to get lucky and I did, dodged a bullet at this one moment and, you know, uh, you know that had killed five other studios that were doing the exact same thing that I was doing, right? So, so I'm very careful about this. Um, I spent some time thinking about um, other companies that have succeeded and failed and tried to cross-reference the stuff that I'm talking about with what they did. And I, I think I settled with a small group, but I fully admit uh, the culture of our company and the time and place that we came to be may have obviously some influence on the extent to which this was helpful for us, but hopefully it'll be helpful for you as well. So number one, uh, we, as a company, we always make sure to have options. And this applies to many different things. Uh, here on the slide, I'm showing you picture uh, the logos of, of distributors, right? Of, you know, you've got Apple, you've got Steam, you've got Google Play, Xbox, etc. Like at any given time, we're talking to all of these. And we've always been like that. We, we're not like other indies. There are other indies I know that they just, they get really in bed with one organization like, like Apple or like PlayStation and that's it. And they focus all their energy on having a good relationship with that organization and marketing them to those, cu the customers of that platform and so on and so forth. And that's great right up until that company has a reorg and totally changes their strategy or their contact person leaves for another company and all of a sudden they don't have their contact person or, or whatever it is or the platform itself has a problem and is no longer a successful platform or any number of things. And by the way, I'm just, I just threw a few random logos on here. I mean, we worked with many others as well, of course. We worked with Facebook and Amazon and so on and so forth. Um, we're always doing that and I think that's a critical thing. I, when I look at other indies who have failed, um, many of them have failed precisely because they were ultra dependent on one platform and when, th when times got difficult on that one platform, and they always do, like that's how this industry goes, even the best platforms go through cycles, um, they struggled. Uh, you're seeing some of that on Steam now. Steam I have enormous respect for. It's one of the best platforms in the history of video games. Valve I think does a fantastic job running it. I like the people there. I think they have developers best interest at heart. But let's face it, you know, Valve went from shipping uh, a few games a week on Steam to hundreds of games a week on Steam, right? And developers who got used to how easy things were back when it was just a few games on Steam and are now having to compete in a dramatically different market, some of those developers are really struggling. They don't, and they don't have anything else. All they know is PC Steam distribution, right? So those developers are really struggling. Some of them will be fine, some of them won't be. I think it's better when you try to be in as many places as possible. Um, and this philosophy, this philosophy of make sure you have options, it applies to everything in life. And I really, really, really believe this. If you're hiring an employee, you don't want to have one candidate or two candidates, right? You want to have 40 candidates so you can find the best one. You're going to work with a publisher, you want to be talking to 10 publishers, not one. Particularly in the case of an, something that involves a negotiation, right? I mean, if you're only talking to one or two publishers and you get one bad offer, how do you say no? You have nothing to fall back on. You just have that one bad offer. You talk to 10 or 20 publishers, okay, now you have three or four offers and you can, you actually have some negotiation leverage, right? Whatever it is, whatever you're thinking about in life, you always want to have, and, and in business, you always want to have options. Um, and this is something that I think, I really want to emphasize this because I think this is something that a lot of indies really struggle with. Partially because it's hard, right? If you're two or three people, working in a garage, trying to make a game, and on top of that, to be working with all the different, you know, talking to many different publishers and many different distributors and so on and so forth, it, it's, it's daunting. And I understand it's daunting, but it's also really important and it's worth putting time into. Um, and so case in point, actually, one of the most important places to have options as far as we're concerned, and we really think this is one of the main reasons we've been successful, is in your own portfolio of games. We never work on one, just one game at a time. Right now, and this is, particularly extreme, we're, we're working on more than we ever have before. Right now, we're working on five games at the same time. We're working on Beartopia, which is a VR game for Daydream. We're working on Alpha Bear 2, um, which we just started recently. We're working on Steambird's Alliance, which is, it's like the spiritual successor to Realm of the Mad God. It's another bullet hell shooter MMO, co-op MMO. 
uh, and two prototypes that don't have names yet, all at the same time with just 17 people. You know, that's not bad, right? Five legit games with 17 people. Each one of them, of course, has a very small team. The Beartopia team is bigger than the prototype team, of course. The prototype might literally just be one engineer and a part-time artist and a part-time designer, uh, while Beartopia has four engineers on it now. But nevertheless, they're all relatively small, and we move people around as needed between them. And why do we do this? We do this because you want to have options in life, and that includes in your games. Some of these games will fail. Like, odds are some of these games, it doesn't matter how good they are, some of these games are going to fail, particularly the prototypes. Super high chance that we're going to have to toss those out at some point. Um, and I don't want to look back two years from now and say, oh man, we put all the company's resources in this one project, and that one project didn't work out. And they don't work out for tons of reasons that are not in your control. They don't work out because the market changed unexpectedly. Maybe a week before you launch the game that you've been working on for four years, Blizzard launches a game in the same category. Well, you're dead, say goodbye, right? You know, the, the, you know or you're, you know, you, let's say the platform lets you down. We've had this, we've had situations where platforms that we have very good relationships with, excellent relationships with, um, just unexpectedly don't feature the game at all. And, and we're like, how did that happen? And we've known these people for years. We work with them really well. They love us. We love them. No feature. I don't know why, right? That, that can happen to you. If it can happen to us, it can happen to you. Um, the dev team could implode for some reason. Like, you know, like some, the lead engineer ends up having some sort of personal crisis and next like, thing you know, the game is struggling, right? Like any number of things can happen and can destroy a game, financially speaking. And if you only have that one game that you're working on, well, good luck, unless you have a huge savings account, you know? So I'm a real big fan of trying to work on multiple games. And uh, so let's talk about that a little bit more. What are you seeing here? This is six different games that you see on this slide that, all, that we made that all failed miserably. In seven years, by the way. Remember, we've only been in business for seven years. Each one of these, and by the way, I'm not even including prototypes. Like, there are tons of prototypes that we work on, and we kill them after one, two, three, four weeks, whatever, or for that matter, a couple months, because they're not fun. These are games that, in some cases, we worked on for as long as two years, because we thought that they were going to be good, and they were going to be fun. And then, for whatever the reason, they failed, and we lost virtually everything on them. Like, every, all the, I, I picked these six on purpose because they had almost no profit. Like, you know, we, we made like, you know, anywhere from zero to 10% of what we spent on them. Um, that's six, guys, six games, significant games, some of that we worked on for up to two years in a span of seven years. This would have killed lots of other companies and has killed lots of other companies. Lots of companies who were not invited to come speak at this event are, were not, are not here precisely because they went out and made really good games that failed anyway. That's just life, that's how it works. So why didn't it kill us? Like I said, it didn't kill us because at the exact same, the exact same time that we were failing on these games, we were launching Triple Town, we were launching Alpha Bear, we were launching Realm of the Mad God, and those games saved us. Um, another thing that I think has been important to our success, and I was, I, I, honestly, I was a little bit, I was torn about whether to include this slide. When I say we hired the best, in quotes, everyone thinks that they're trying to hire the best, right? And what does the best even mean? It depends on the company. Someone who would be the best employee at Amazon or Microsoft may not be the best employee for Spry Fox, because we have totally different cultures. So I really don't want you to hear me talking about this and hear me talk about what I think makes the best person and then say, okay, well, we can only hire people like that. Like, your company culture is different, you're different, you're doing different things than we are, you're doing things in a different way than we are, your best may be better than our best. But I think it is true that regardless of what the best means to you, hiring the best person for your company is always worth putting a, time, a ton of time and energy into. It's the most important thing you can be doing, next to obviously making a great game. And of course, if you don't do this, you won't make a great game, probably. So let me talk to you a little bit about what means the best in Spry Fox. We ask a few questions of ourselves for every single person we're interviewing. We ask, do they seem reliable, for example? That's a, oops, sorry, just jumping ahead. The, the, do, they, do they seem reliable? Um, because again, we don't micromanage, we're a remote studio, you're working from home alone, there's no one there to look over your shoulder if, you, if, you're, if you're not going to be doing what you need to do, uh, you're not going to succeed. Uh, are they a self-starter? Same sort of thing. Um, we ask ourselves, um, do they seem honest? That's super important. We don't want to work with people who are dishonest, partially because it's going to be harder to figure that out since they're not with us, partially because working with dishonest people sucks, just in general. 
and in a family, you don't want to, you don't want liars in your family, right? Um, we ask ourselves if they seem like they're in the top 2% of their profession. And of course, that's a squishy number, right? There's no way to like, be like, oh, this person's 3%, they're out. Like, you, you know what I mean. It's just in general, like, do they seem like they're really good? Will we learn from them? Are they going to make us better at what we do? Um, and we have a few other questions. Like, uh, are, do, do they want to make the world a better place? That's a really important thing to us. We want to make games that make people happy and bring happiness into the world. Money is a secondary objective success, fame, those are all secondary objectives. If there's someone who we interview and they seem really good, but they seem like they would be really sad if they made a game that made tons of people happy but only broke even, we won't hire that person because we're going to end up doing that. And that's what's most important to us. We want to make people happy. So I don't want to hire someone if they're going to be miserable because we're not giving them, you know, a million dollar bonus at the end of the day. Like, that's just not a priority for us. Um, every time I've hired someone, who meets all of those criteria, and there's more that I haven't gotten into, but um, we've always been super happy. And any time I've been feeling pressure to hire someone because there was some opportunity that I wanted to seize, and we had to seize it right now, and we had to hire someone right away, and, and I've hired someone who isn't a yes to every single one of those questions, I've regretted it every time. Um, and I think that's, that's meaningful, right? Like, I, I'm at this point in my life willing to pass on big opportunities if it would force me to hire someone who isn't a yes on every one of our questions. Um, we always play test with strangers. This, I think, is critical. This is something I think we made a lot of mistakes of early in our life. We would work for, like, a year or two on a game, and we would show it to, like, friends and family, but for the most part, we, that was it. Um, that's a huge mistake. I cannot encourage this enough. Play test your game as often as you can, as much as you can, with people who aren't like really good friends of yours and, tell you, and aren't gonna tell you what you wanna hear, right? Um, we use a service called usertesting.com, which is where you can upload your game and then get videos of people playing it, total strangers. But you know, if you can't afford to do that or don't wanna do that for whatever the reason or you know, can't technically for some reason, that's fine too. There have been times where I have literally gone to coffee shops and asked total strangers to play my game or gone to like the park and like, hey you, you seem like you might enjoy a puzzle game, like play my game. And they're like, who the hell are you? But they'll, you know, you know. But I'll do whatever it takes to get fresh eyes on the game because you always, you, it doesn't matter how good a designer you are, you will constantly be shocked by things that players do in your game and, ha and, and be like, oh wow, if I didn't know that, I'd be in trouble. So um, I just want to show this mostly for fun. This video is a, a we were, a, this is going to be a video of a, a, a prototype we were making of an educational version of Alpha Bear. We wanted to, we made it so that there's those little apple tiles on the board, and if you tap on the apple tile, a little procedurally generated quiz will show up, and it's a vocabulary quiz. It shows you a word that it randomly picks from the dictionary, and then random definitions, and you have to pick the correct one. And we were like, oh, we'll see if this is fun and if people learn from it or whatever. Um, totally random, like I said. Check out something that happened in one of these play tests that we were not expecting. Oh, you can't hear. What is the correct definition of shit? <laughs> a coarse term for defecation. This guy, by the way, is hysterical. You can't hear his voice because I just realized we don't have audio, unfortunately. But literally, he's like, uh-huh, a coarse term for defecation. Yes. Um, the, 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 we had no, we just forgot that there were bad words in the dictionary. <laughs> And this popped up, we were like, oh my god. So, you know, yeah, this is a little fuzzy. Like, this obviously wasn't necessarily a revelation so much as it was an amusing moment that, thank goodness, we caught before it went live. Um, but, um, but, like, there have been lots of other things that we'll catch in playtest where we're like, it never would have occurred to us that a player would get stuck at that moment or would do this thing or would get upset about this thing or whatever. Um, this is probably one of the most important parts of our process now. From a very early point, from well before the game is published, when it still has prototype art even in some cases, we'll put it in front of strangers. Um, and then lastly, we network all the time. So obviously being here at Unity Dev Day is a, is a fantastic thing, and it's a good thing that you're doing it. Um, I, just so you know, personally, for years now, even from the very beginning of the company, I have been going to like at least one GDC and PAX West Seattle and Casual Connect and E3 almost every single year. And the reason I do that is because this industry changes so fast, it is very easy to get out of touch. Um, and, it's, and it's so important, separately from that, to have meaningful relationships with other de developers. Because again, you're just one, or in our case, 17 people. Like, you can only know and do so much. But there's so much going on in the industry and so much changing. Like, you need to have relationships with other people. You need to be talking to other people. You need to be seeing what's going on. If you don't do that, you're going to get left behind. 
Um, I really do believe that the fact that I and other people in SpryFox attend as many events as can and talk to as many other developers as possible. I'm in like four different online developer groups where we share problems and talk to each other about stuff, and it's enormously helpful, and I, can't, I cannot encourage this enough. I really feel like spending a bunch of your time getting to know other developers and platforms and what's going on in the world and talking to other developers is one of the most valuable things you can do with your time, so it's good that you're here, and I, I hope you'll keep doing that sort of thing. Um, and uh, that's all uh, I've got. Thank you very much. Eh, ya estamos a punto de, de terminar, solo un par de minutos más, porque vamos muy, muy atrás en, en el tiempo. Eh, hay otra persona de Unity que vino desde las, tier, las lejanas tierras de San Francisco. Él es el, 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 el director de desarrollo de negocios de Unity. Él viene aquí, pues ahorita les va a contar a qué. Pero bueno, le cedo un par de minutos a Rafael Ruland de Unity para que nos platique qué hacen. Uh, hola, mi nombre es uh, Rafael Rulán, trabajo en, en Unity y es todo de uh, voy a comunicar en español. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to take a couple minutes to uh, to talk to everyone here because I really wanted to impress upon how much this means to Unity to have everybody here, and I just want everybody to take a moment to give yourself a round of applause just for coming together as a community. The other thing that I want to point out, and if we could take a moment, if the folks from Unity could stand or raise their hands for a brief moment to kind of show uh, everybody who's here. Stand up. So we have over 10 people here from Unity, um, all the way from Sao Paulo, Mexico City, uh, New York, Seattle, San Francisco. And the reason that we're all here and spending time with you is because we value community. Uh, Unity itself is nothing without the community of developers and students and everyone who shares the interests in developing something cool and something special. And that's why you know, it was great having David here to speak to all of you because so many of you go through the same experiences or s strive to go through the same experiences to become successful, to just to build something that other people enjoy, content that people can consume, and really try to understand the best way to do that. So a lot of our focus, and for my team's focus, and we're based in San Francisco, is to spend time and traveling to all the different regions to meet with developers like yourselves and to understand you know, what you're trying to build, how you're using Unity, and most importantly, how we can help. And you know, one of the things I took away from David's slides is the, the value of commitment. And I think that rings true for Unity as well, is because we realize how committed we have to be to serving our community in order for ourselves to be successful. You know, so our team, we work with big developers like EA and Blizzard and Riot and Kabam and Glue and Zynga and a number of others, but then also with very strategic developers like SpryFox and even people who are not even making games. VR, AR, you name it. I mean, we look at all the different ways that Unity is being used, and we're seeing, especially, especially with the emergence of VR, VR and AR, that the applications of Unity is extending far and wide and beyond games into automotive, into architecture, engineering, construction. And I know many of you and some of the folks that I've spoken to already here in Mexico City are doing a lot of those things. So, one of the things that we're focusing on the most is making sure that we're developing the best tools, the best content, the best platform to enable your success. And you know, we've, we've put together some really great content from some, from some great experts here for you today, representative of this community as well as some of the folks from Unity so that we can really evangelize and showcase the things that we're doing. And you know, we'll be around throughout the day. And I want to encourage all of you to spend time with us 
and to ask the questions, and we want to build a relationship with you. We want you to know that Unity is not a platform, a tool that has a website, and that you're kind of on your own. We want to foster user groups. We want to foster the community. We want to establish a relationship and so that you know that we have a name and we have a face, and that you can communicate and talk to us so that we can help you solve the hard problems, because that's what our mission is all about. We want to democratize development. We want to solve the hard problems for you so that you can focus on building great designs and great content. So again, I appreciate everybody being here on behalf of Unity. Uh, thank you very much. Bueno, y ya por último, solo para cerrar el keynote, eh, mi compañera Ashley Alicea de Unity. Un aplauso. Hola. Buenos días a todos. Este, yo también tengo que disculpar por mi español. Este, soy de Puerto Rico, donde nuestro idioma oficial es Spanglish y no español. So, voy a tratar de explicar el evento um, mejor que yo puedo. Pero bienvenidos al evento de Unity Developer Day México 2017. Uh, yo soy encargada de los eventos del equipo Evangelismo de Unity y también soy la encargada de la serie de conferencias de Unity Developer Day. Este es el segundo Developer Day que hemos tenido en México y es para mí un honor y un placer tener el primer Developer Day de 2007 aquí de nuevo en la Ciudad de México. Pero rapidito para repasar el evento. Tenemos unas charlas maravillosas este, de uh, gente de Unity que vienen de los, uh, por todas las Américas y también desarrolladores locales uh, aquí en México y también Colombia. También tenemos unos juegos fantásticos que están en el showcase, el mismo detrás de este salón. Aquí detrás está el showcase, hay dos pasillos en cada lado de eh, este salón, se pueden pasar por los pasillos para el uh, final, para llegar a ver todos los juegos uh, que están hechos con Unity, hechos en México. <risa> Y este, la agenda de hoy se puede encontrar afuera en las mesas, también se puede encontrar en este enlace, si quieren tomar una foto para poder verlos eh, en internet, que es bit.ly en mayúscula ddmx17. Y este, vamos a acabar ahora mismo uh, aquí, vamos a hacer el coffee break rapidito y de, después a las once y media empezamos, o ya pronto casi, <ríe> con este charlas y el showcase, seguimos hasta la 1 de la tarde donde va, eh, va a ser el almuerzo, el almuerzo va a estar en el primer piso, en el lobby, hay un cafetería este, y también a, a mismo bajo de este salones hay más este, uh, buffets de comer. Y seguimos con, <ríe> seguimos con más charlas a las 2 hasta las uh, 4 y media también, este, tenemos el showcase um, y después a la, uh, al cuarto y media hasta las 5 tenemos este, las últimas charlas uh, del evento. Y también este, eh, animo a ustedes para usar nuestros hashtags en el evento, si quieres postear en Facebook, en Twitter, en lo que sea, nuestro hashtag es Unity Developer Day, y si vas a hablar de Showcase, también puedes poner hashtag Made with Unity. Y eso es todo, muchas gracias y que disfruten el evento.